I, James M. Curley, do solemnly swear, solemnly swear, that I will bear true faith and allegiance, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the Commonwealth. In 1935, James Michael Curley was sworn in as governor of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And will support the Constitution thereof. So help me God. So help me God. His climb up the political ladder had begun in earnest three decades earlier, when he was elected to Boston's Board of Aldermen while serving 60 days in the county jail. That conviction for taking a civil service examination on behalf of one of his less gifted constituents later became a symbol of Jim Curley's career as a politician. Quite simply, his supporter said, he did it for a friend. Mayor of Boston for 16 years, congressman for eight, governor of Massachusetts for two, Curley was one of the most successful politicians of the 20th century. But with victory came defeat, once for U.S. Senate, twice for governor, and six times for mayor. He would always get nervous if a, an election was at hand and he didn't have something to run for. My dad always said there was only one James Michael Curley and he was not a crook. If he took from the rich, he gave to the poor. Rascal or Robin Hood, saint or sinner, the voters of Boston never seemed to tire of James Michael Curley. Vote early and often for Curley. He's bound to go places, they say. He's going to be mayor, and the chances are fair that he'll sit in the state house one day. His voice is as rich as a fruitcake. Bill Shakespeare, he quotes with a vim. He charms all the voters like birds in a tree. He sounds like a guy with an Oxford degree. It's 50 to 1 that our next mayor he'll be. And if Curley has been efficient, and Curley has been economical, and Curley has been humane, and Curley has safeguarded the welfare of the people, you have clearly a duty to perform tomorrow. So mark your ballots for Jim for him. Just mark your ballots for Jim. As I, as I came across the political horizon, uh, they either had an intense liking for him or an intense feeling against him. He usually would have more people who liked him intensely than disliked him unless he made him a slip during the campaign. But if he went through a campaign without that, he usually had the votes to win. Throughout much of his 50-year career, Curley could depend on the votes of the Irish and the other ethnic groups of Boston. To them, he was the mayor of the poor. He gave us all baskets and globe yeah. Santa. He was known, actually, as being the most kind-hearted individual uh, in the world, actually. Uh, he was the easiest touch. When he walked from the back of City Hall up City Hall Avenue to the Parker House, that man uh, literally gave uh, hundreds of dollars away to unfortunate people who waited for him. Knew that he traditionally would walk up to the Parker House for lunch or afterward, and, uh, and, or he would ride into the communities uh, of the North End or South Boston or Roxbury and throw so half dollars out of the window of his car. No matter how high he got in position, he never forgot from where he came. James Michael Curley, was born in the Roxbury section of Boston on November the 20th, 1874. His parents, Michael and Sarah, were two of more than a million and a half Irish who fled their homeland after the devastating potato famine and plague of 1847. Thousands of immigrants boarded the sail and steam vessels of the Cunard Line, bound for Boston. Those strong enough to survive the six-week passage were often herded into rows of crumbling tenements, the Irish ghettos of a city unprepared for such a sudden influx. The Yankees, descended from New England's British settlers, saw the Irish as at best cheap labor, at worst a threat to their way of life. Like many ambitious young Irishmen of his day, Curley saw politics as a way out of the ghetto a path to fortune and respectability held almost exclusively by the Yankees. But it was soon apparent that Curley stood a cut above the rest of the crowd. He was very colorful. In the first place, he, he was a big man. He wasn't one of those grotesque types that the cartoonists portray. He was a strong, powerful figure. 
he would start off in the barber shop in the first thing in the morning and get well groomed and, and his clothes were always tailor made. He probably had one of the grandest voices ever given to any speaker. They can talk about their Patrick Henry's and everybody else, but he was a man that never had a college education. Even people that didn't like him would go miles just to hear him make a speech. There's only one thing to do with General Depression, load him on an awful wagon and dump his rotten carcass in Boston Harbor as our ancestors dumped rotten tea there in 1774. During the campaigns, it was a regular tour. No matter where it was, it, it had the uh, feeling of a first nighter in Hollywood, uh, Grauman's Theater. Uh, the, the crowd would be first uh, steamed up, if you might use the word, worked up, and uh, by the time they would be to such a pitch when Curly got there that uh, they were ready to pick him up on the shoulders and march uh, to hell if they had to. And his favorite song was The Isle of Capri. And the band would bring him into the Donald McKay School in East Boston, playing the Isle of Capri, and the crowds would go delirious. And it is a very great pleasure for me to present at this time, without any question of doubt, the greatest mayor that Boston has had, or in my opinion will ever have, the Honorable James M. Kelly. Somebody say, oh, Curly's going to speak at Dodger Street and Broadway, which is this corner. Crowds would gather from all over South Boston. No mics, no nothing, but you could hear his voice very distinctly. I devoted 35 years of my life in the hopes that someday there might be some system of government devised whereby all might enjoy the fullest possible measure of equality. <laughs> Sometimes we would have two or three hecklers in our own crowd go in the back of the crowd and give them a rash. That's when the coat would come off and the tide would come off and he'd really go after them. Curly could be a bruising campaigner, arrogant and even contemptuous of his opponent. His second mayoral campaign against John R. Murphy in 1921 has been called the most vicious and vituperative in Boston's history. He struck directly at Murphy's long years of public service, calling him an old mustard plaster that's been stuck on the back of the people for 50 years. He even made a phony issue of his opponent's religious beliefs, hinting that Murphy had converted from Catholicism and might divorce his wife to marry a 16-year-old child. Sometimes, Curley's campaign tactics backfired. In 1924, he decided to take a shot at the State House. His opponent was millionaire auto dealer Alvin T. Fuller. Curly needed an issue, and so he conjured up an issue, the Ku Klux Klan, which was a good issue around Boston. Uh, but uh, how could you dramatize it? And so his campaign uh, followers arranged to have burning crosses on the hillsides whenever Curly came to a place. He uh, referred to them, I think, as uh, uh, political pranks rather than dirty tricks. That was the uh, regular routine of the day in those days. As far as I've read history, all through the ages, there's always a little finagling going on. It's, uh, it seems uh, natural. In the 1930s, Curley added another weapon to his bag of campaign tricks, radio. The facilities of this station had been engaged for the next 30 minutes by His Honor James M. Curley, former mayor of the city of Boston, who speaks to you on the subject, is, Mr. is Mayor Mansfield prevaricator or just plain stupid? Curley saved some of his sharpest barbs for the Brahmins, the elite among Boston's Yankees. They control business, the banks, and the Republican Party. And to Curley, they were the natural enemies of Boston's Irish. People were, were hungry, they had no shoes and food, and, and uh, he, he, he attracted those people as versus his Republican opponents who came from uh, uh, great wealth and uh, great position in society. St. Patrick's and Faraway Island, he drove out the snakes in a rout. And Curly, they say, in the very same way, will kick the Republicans out. The dollars piled up by the masters. Their kindred enjoy them today. 
the industrial slave lay in unmarked graves. It was the good old Republican way. Curley's opponent in the 1938 campaign for governor was an ideal adversary. Massachusetts House Speaker Leverett Saltonstall was a Republican and a Brahmin. The entire record of Leverett Saltonstall could be written on a miniature postal card. The record of Curley would require a volume almost as large as Webster's unabridged dictionary. Apparently, uh, that was based on uh, some uh, opening of some speech he made where he said his words were like an unabridged Webster dictionary. And I, as a Yankee, had very little uh, education or very little ability to speak, and he was dead right. In later years, Curley boasted that he outlived one of his most persistent critics, that paragon of civic virtue, the Good Government Association. He called them the Goo Goos. The Good Government Association was a beautiful target for Curley to attack because they had names that echoed well in Democrats' ears. Uh, Abigail Holmans. But he'd get into Pemberton Square outside Barristers Hall where the Good Government Association had its offices and he would denounce Abigail Holmans and he'd look up to the seventh or eighth floor and yell, Abigail, are you there? Are you listening? And it was great entertainment for the hoi polloi. They loved it. He tended to polarize the community with his attacks on the, uh, the uh, wealthy Brahmins, the State Street wrecking crew, as he called it, the codfish aristocracy. Behind this, actually, and setting them to one side and the poor and the newer races on the other, behind this, actually, I think there lay a considerable amount of admiration for the best among the Brahmins. The days of the Brahmins are numbered. They're standing at bay in Back Bay. They're all in retreat up and down Beacon Street. Uh, on occasions, he threatened them that he would uh, jack their assessment up or shut the water off in their banks, and, and they came across with some help for him. With Curly, the sure hell to pay. Only once in his long career did Curly make a serious break with his Irish constituents. In 1928, he gave his enthusiastic support for the unsuccessful presidential bid of Irish Catholic Al Smith. But four years later, Curley shocked the nation and enraged his people back home in Boston by endorsing the wealthy governor of New York, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. We have a feeling that you shouldn't continue to come here as governor. You should come in a more exalted capacity. And so we're looking forward to welcoming you as president sometime within the next two years. Curley was shut out of the pro-Smith Massachusetts delegation to the Chicago nominating convention. But, in typical style, he fast-talked his way onto the delegation from Puerto Rico, convincing the chairman that he should withdraw in Curley's favor. Had he stuck with uh, Smith and with the regular uh, traditional uh, Irish leadership uh, of, of, of the Democratic Party at that time, he would have been just a soldier in the ranks. And Curley was not one to sit in the back of the row. He wanted to uh, be up in front with the, you know, be the general. Conveniently, he became the delegate from Puerto Rico, and they called him Don Jamie. Alcalde Jaime Miguel Curlio proudly cast the six votes of the island of Puerto Rico for the next president of the United States, FDR. He returned to Boston a hero. A new star is rising in Boston, a son of old Erin, they say. I wish James Michael was alive today. His voice has the swell of a Paul Revere bell and he's making political hay. He'd straighten things out now if he were here. If you get a chance to support him, he'll never forget and you'll find you'll never go broke if you vote for that bloke. It's something to fix in your mind. Everything he done was good. I helped the people, I'll tell you that much. Not like the rough rough we got today. And another man I wish was living today is Colonel Cushing. James Michael Curley, the elected official, brought his unique style of politics into office with him. Curleyism meant a highly personal rather than a party machine. In 1935, when James Michael Curley came first to the State House as governor, he brought with him the people 
crowds, noise and activity. It resembled more a standing room crowd in the lobby of the Boston Garden than it did in the sedate outer office of the chief executive of the Commonwealth. And his entrance into the office from the elevator was was really something because he always had officers with him and secretaries and aides and everything else. And just getting through that outer office from the elevator into here sometimes took a well over a half hour to get into his office. Everybody could see Curly. Anybody who came in, the poor little scrub woman that wanted to see him, could see him. And he'd uh, take each one individually, listen to their confession, give them absolution, <laughs> as he used to say, pick up the phone, in many cases, and secure jobs for them in private industry. And uh, the peculiar part of that was, I recall one time, several times, he'd call, them, call up someone like the president of the uh, Lever Brothers Corporation, someone like that, get him on the phone, say, I have a young man here who I've known for about 25 years, very qualified. He's an exceptional typist, he's a good stenographer, he's uh, sober at all times, I think you could use him on your payroll or they'd be an asset to you. And then over the phone, while, <laughs> while he'd have the phone, he'd hold it and say, what the hell's your name? <laughs> he wouldn't know the phone's name at all. <laughs> but he gave him great build-ups and got a lot of jobs for people that way. Uh, yes, I came out to Boston uh, in 49 and I met uh, on a Friday, I met James Michael Curley on Sunday morning, had an interview with him in the Shamrock Lodge in Jamaica Plain. Thereupon, through his intercession, I was working the following Monday afternoon. James Michael's father and my grandfather were cousins. Actually, he would be a distant relation of ours. I can remember as a young legislator when I'd go in to see him, uh, I'd ask him, for favors for someone, like a 25 cent increase for somebody who was a, a laborer, per 25 cents a day. If he could do it, he'd pick up the phone and do it. He was a man of action. On a larger scale, Curley became the sponsor of scores of social reform measures. It was he who, for example, fought manfully from the very earliest years on the old common council and later as, as mayor and as governor for a shorter work week, for example, for the overworked persons in the mental hospitals and the other institutions of the state. Well, he respected especially, as he called them, the little people. Don't make a difference whether you're Irish or not. He helped anybody. It was he who argued forcefully that pay should be adequate in municipal and state employment. Before old age pensions were adopted, he was urging old age pensions and unemployment insurance. He was an articulate voice, in other words, in the early days of the New Deal and before that, going way back. Yeah, when James Michael saw the scrub women on their knees uh, doing the work at City Hall, he thought it was too much for them, so thereupon he got them long-handled brushes, which was a big help. You bet your life. No more scrubbing. No. Ask those women in the State House. They'll never forget them. No. Those poor women scrubbing I wish, floors. I wish she was arrived now. Curly was a builder and the projects he completed during his terms in office changed the face of Boston. Now I like to think that by looking around not only in Ward 6 and 7, but in every ward in Boston, we behold monuments erected perhaps not to the genius of Curly, but to enduring signs of his civic foresight and resourcefulness. I think he taught thousands and thousands of Bostonians to love their city, to be proud of it. It was my privilege to give Boston my native city, the finest of hospitals, health units, schools, and libraries. I built every worthwhile rapid transit facility, except the original subway. Curley spent lavishly on his public works projects, and many, including Boston's Watchdog Finance Commission, believed he and his friends were lining their pockets with city funds. No, they never got anything on them. They never got any contractors to come up and say they gave them anything. If they could, they would have made trouble for them. But uh, I think it's a mistake to evaluate Curley on the rumors around town about his being a crook. Uh, as you get older, and God knows I'm old enough, as you get older, uh, larceny don't count. He may have got a, 
into a spot of trouble uh, here and there, but it was only a minor detail regarding uh, as far as the opinion of the Irish people was of them. No doubt about it, he enjoyed the better things of life, expensive knickknacks and furnishings, and his $50,000 home on the Jamaica Way in Boston. He had his family and a lot of business people coming in there, and he had to have a big home for everybody to come. Everybody was welcome. He never closed the door to anybody. You could go there any time of the day or the night, and you were always welcome. The Finance Commission tried desperately to determine how the young mayor could afford such a palatial estate. It failed. And the house with the shamrock shutters became a symbol of Curley's defiant attitude toward the more proper Bostonians of his time. Every time I drove by with another fair by James Michael Curley's house, I would point it out to people that didn't live in Boston. And they noticed the shamrock, and uh, they said, he was Irish. I says, what else? After years of frustration, the FinCom finally struck pay dirt in the 1930s when the Curley-appointed city treasurer was charged with the theft of over $170,000 in municipal funds. And as the result of another investigation, Curley himself was ordered to repay $42,000, unaccounted for after the settlement of a lawsuit against the city. Throughout it all, Curley held to his contention that he was serving with integrity, but his honesty had become a serious campaign issue. They know that there is only one issue in this campaign, and that is a moral issue. My election as governor will not be a personal victory. It will be a victory for decency. Politicians who are giants in pharmacies and pygmies in performance have no place in public life. The issue was the expenditure of government funds, the repairs to the roads and so on and uh, on the boxes for uh, sand on the highways where the state was being uh, charged $75. And I had an appraisal made, they were, at most they were worth $25. And the waste paper baskets in the executive office were charged at uh, $25. And I figured out uh, that they were worth at the most $5. A clock! Oh, we could have, we could afford crooks like that. My father will tell you. He saved our lives. Curly took care of his friends, all right? And that's no different than what they do today. Curly's popularity made a grand jury's indictment in Boston almost impossible. And the local district attorneys adopted a hands-off attitude. But in 1945, a Washington grand jury did take action, indicting then-Congressman James M. Curley after a Senate committee found his name on the letterhead of a company being investigated for mail fraud. He found out about it in Washington. I was down in Washington with him at the time in Congress. Uh, he was amazed when he hit the roof when he found out his name was on the letterhead. He was trying to help this fellow to get some business with the federal government, but he went ahead and put Curley's name on it as president of the company, which he wasn't. His trial was delayed so he could campaign for mayor, and he won, beating his closest opponent two to one. Two months after his inauguration, Mayor Curley was found guilty of mail fraud. And after exhausting the appeal process, he entered Danbury Federal Prison saying, you have sentenced me to die. Well, I am uh, supposed to be literate, and I've tried to figure out what he went to jail for, and I never could figure it out. I'm satisfied that Jim Curley was a political prisoner. Whether or not Curley was guilty of mail fraud is still a subject of debate, but many of his opponents felt the Washington conviction made up for wrongdoing overlooked by local authorities. I think they can say what they want about. He was, I say he was an honest man, believe me. I don't think he did any serve that he went to jail for, because he didn't stay in jail for long. When President Truman commuted his sentence five months later, Curley's return to Boston was a triumphal procession. But this was Curley's last hurrah. In 1949, he left office, a half century after his first election to Boston's Common Council. Age and personal tragedy had caught up with him. His first wife died at the height of his career, and he outlived seven of his nine children. Personally, he was a great family man, number one. Number two, he was a very religious man, contrary to what, contrary to what some people may believe. He had a lot of tragedy in his family, they affect him somewhat for a while, but he get over it, figure it was all part of life, and it was God's will. 
Curley kept running until 1955, three years before his death. But it was mainly an opportunity to make new friends and keep the campaign funds trickling in. Still, he hadn't lost his charm. I trust you will pardon me, my good women of Boston, for intruding myself at a time when you were preparing the noonday meal for the children coming home from school. But I regard you as my friends, which you always have been. Despite his continued popularity, he was no longer a match for younger men, once his protégés, who had moved onto the political scene. James Michael Curley died on November the 12th, 1958, leaving behind only a meager personal estate. He died a poor man, and he was a wonderful man. In a tribute befitting a hero, Boston mourned. James Michael's funeral was one of the biggest uh, that was ever seen in this area. And of course all his friends, including the, the scrub women and the little people, the poor of the city of Boston, the rich of the city of Boston, everybody came to pay their last respects to James Michael. And they did also say a special prayer for James Michael that he would be put as close as possible to St. Peter. They figured he deserved that spot in heaven. My entire career has been devoted to public service, and to my public trust, I have always been faithful. To those who were in want, I have brought comfort and a ray of hope for the working woman and man. I have made their lot a little easier, and to honest, sound, and humane government, I have zealously applied myself in the past to the task of providing it, and fortunately, I have succeeded. <laughs>